Well, the last uh, several chapels that I've spoken, we've been talking about the glory, the majesty, the greatness of God, and we've done it a couple of different ways. We started with Job, because uh, I'm convinced that maybe the critical place where, where God's greatness is to be seen is in suffering. Uh, God likes to do things that are uh, uh, counterintuitive, that, that at the very place where it would seem God could be least seen to be great, uh, he can show himself to be greater than we ever thought he could be. Uh, but we've moved on now to the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40. We're kind of camping out there. We were there a week and a half ago, and we're here again this morning. And I, I want to read you the first uh, five verses of this, uh, this great chapter uh, where God is so exalted. Uh, but I want you to notice, and I want to say just a couple of things about the first two words. So let's put the words up on the screen there. Uh, Isaiah begins, actually he's saying what God told him to say. He said, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Now let's just think a bit about comfort. Uh, comfort is peace, uh, reassurance. It's to be uh, calmed in the face of fear. It's, it's to feel good. God says, I want you to comfort my people. I want them to feel better. Well, they've been in exile. They've been punished for their sins. They're really down. So encourage them. Now, how do we get to encouragement? Uh, I want to read you two quotes, one by George Bernanos. He said, truth is meant to save you first, and the comfort comes afterwards. Meaning... Uh, Comfort is the result of dealing with the truth. And uh, the people who lived in exile in Babylonia have been living in the truth, a, a, a very un inconvenient, a very unpleasant truth. They have disobeyed God. They have failed to live up to what he called them to be. And so they have suffered for that. This is a harsh truth. And now they may be comforted. First, the bad news. Now the good news. Uh, truth precedes comfort. Uh, another quote from C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity. Uh, if you look for truth, you may find comfort in the end. If you look only for comfort, you will not get either comfort or truth. Only wishful thinking to begin with and in the end, despair. So there's a relationship between truth and comfort. Now, frankly, I like to go right for the comfort. But Lewis is right, and we'll see it again in Isaiah 40, that there is no real lasting comfort without dealing with real and sometimes harsh truth. So let me read just the first uh, five verses, and then we'll move through part of the, the chapter. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling. In the wilderness or the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now we'll move through some other verses here. Uh, Arthur Rubenstein, uh, great piano virtuoso, was being interviewed on the radio and he was discussing his passion, which was music. He loved it. Uh, when the interviewer took an abrupt turn in the conversation and asked him, Mr. Rubenstein, do you believe in God? Uh, he was obviously irritated by the question. And he said, no. You see, what I believe in is something much greater. Of course, it was music. Now, there's a bit of Arthur Rubenstein in all of us. Uh, St. Augustine had a formal definition of God. He said, God, and I quote, is the one greater than whom... Nothing can be imagined. The one greater than whom nothing can be imagined. And that's also a good practical definition. 
In other words, we may formally subscribe to the doctrines of Christianity. We may believe in the deity of Christ, in the authority of scriptures, and yet we may live as though we didn't. We may live as though the one greater than whom nothing can be imagined is really ourselves or our health or our jobs or our money or our homes or our personal freedom. And according to the Bible, it's the practical definition that matters, not the formal. It's not what you say you believe, but it's what you live as though you believed that tells you what you believe in. Hmm. So the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Well, nobody in the ancient world to whom this psalm was written uh, be didn't believe in some kind of God. They, I mean, everybody, were, they were theists or polytheists. No, that, that, that idea, that silly idea that came up about 250 years ago, didn't enter into his mind. It was just simply, there is God. Now, but the fool, says the Bible, is the one who lives as though there wasn't. So, there's a watershed question here throughout all of these studies and in Isaiah. Who do you trust? Who do you believe in? Who do you act as though they were the one, or it was the one, greater than whom nothing can be imagined? Well, Isaiah takes a negative approach. He says, let's, let's compare God to some of the things we think might be greater than whom nothing could be imagined. Uh, one good way is to compare us to God. And that's what we looked at uh, a week and a half ago. Uh, a voice says, cry out. Verse 6. And I said, what shall I cry? Well, cry out this. All men are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. So about the time we may be tempted to live as though we were, were God or we were the only thing that really matters or our needs, well, God says, well, just consider, you will die. And I won't. So who are you going to trust? Well, this morning it's the universe. Uh, we'll look at the universe and how it compares to God. Verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breadth of his hand, marked off the heavens. Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on a scale? Uh, I've got to unpack some of the language here, but it's, it's really almost funny. Uh, look at your hand, okay? Uh, maybe you did what I did this morning. I went into the uh, bathroom and I ran the water and I just got a little water in the palm of my hand and I splashed it on my face. When God does that, it's the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Arctic, and the Antarctic oceans. Hollow of his hand, and just spread your hand out. Thumb to pinky. Or with the breadth of his hand, marked off the heavens. Earth, the edge of the universe. Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scale, or the hills in a balance. In other words, what Isaiah is portraying God as, or what God is portraying himself to Isaiah as being, he's, he's, like, a, well, he's like a workman in, in a workshop. He's got, uh, he's, got his, he's got his materials. He's got some water, and he's got some earth. He's got some mountains. He's got his tools, and he's just putting it all together. The heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. You know what that, that Hebrew word for work of his hands means? It means something like needlepoint. The kind of thing you get in a, in a craft shop, in a hobby store. Uh, the, the little things you can sort of knit. Well, the heavens, the stars, are like that. To God. When he makes them. Now, did you ever make a land when you were a kid? I still do once in a while. You, know, you find a nice little vacant lot, you get a water hose, you make a mountain, you dig out a little lake, and you make rivers, and you take you know, bits of grass, and you stick them and make them forests, and you, and you put a little car. I, I, isn't that fun? I still like to do that. 
And, you, and then you, you, know, you run the hose, and then you get the river going, and it fills up the lake, and then maybe you put a moat around a castle, and, and you can spend days just making that. Well, that is roughly what this passage is saying God does. Only he's doing it in, in earnest. A, a lump of clay here, a can of paint there, a pile of sand, and some scraps of wood. That's the universe. Whoa. Now, you'll note, uh, that's the universe to God. Now, we are rightly uh, astonished at how big the universe is and how complex it is. Uh, or we should be. Uh, but for God, it's little. It's small. And then, let's, let's just focus it down a bit more here. Uh, idols, uh, verses 18 to 20. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? As for an idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A man too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. Now, I'm reading it too fast because this is just, this is just raw satire. These, these idols you worship, well, listen, you, you, you find some wood that's a small part of a, a universe that God made, you take that wood, you carve it, and then if it doesn't stand up, your God doesn't stand up too well, well, you get some chains to make sure it doesn't fall over. That's your idols. That's the things you worship. And that's silly. Psalm 115. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Nations are looking around. They don't see Yahweh. They don't see any God. So where is he? Huh? Well, we can show you our gods. Where's yours? Our God is in heaven, and he does whatever he pleases. But their idols are silver and gold made with the hands of men. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but they cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but they cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel. They have feet but they cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throat. And all who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. You worship something less than God and you will become something less than yourself. You'll become deaf, dumb, blind, like the idol you worship. Wow. My buddy, who's actually a little bit older than me now, uh, he said the turning point in his life, now, you know, this, you've seen that bumper sticker, you know, he who dies with the most toys wins. That's really old. I mean, the sentiment is even older than the bumper sticker. Uh, but he bought, and uh, this is back in, I think, the early 1960s, uh, Dodge came out with a car called the Demon. The Dodge Demon. And it was always in as reds and oranges and bright yellows and stuff like that. And he loved his Dodge Demon. And, and uh, he, was, he was kind of flirting with Christianity. He was a student at UCLA at the time. And uh, he was living in an apartment building. And the apartment building caught on fire. And uh, it was in the middle of the night. And he ran out to the Dodge Demon. <laughs> he didn't, you know, see the symbolism of that. But he ran out to get his precious. <laughs> and one of his buddies tackled him in the parking lot moments before... The car exploded. Well, that's the way it is with toys, with idols. Uh, little bits and pieces of a creation that for God is like the thing a, a, a craftsman puts together in a workshop or maybe a child in a vacant lot. I mean, this is, this is easy for God to do. How can you worship some piece of it well, how about the stars? Verse 25. Uh, to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Now, I've I got to tell you something about the ancient world. This is going to be hard to believe. But did you know, in the ancient world, people actually believed. Now, again, this is, I, this is stretching, I know. But they actually believed that the stars exerted influence on humans. 
No, I know, it's just outrageous. I mean, they actually would read, you know, the, the alignment of the planets and, and they would make predictions about what you should do and, and who you should marry. I mean, I mean, again, I know that's just crazy. Well, Isaiah says, well, or God says, through Isaiah, um, I control the stars, by the way. Those stars that you worship and you think control you, I control them. And it's really interesting. He calls them each by name, this starry host. And, and the term is, uh, it's, it's like, it's a military term. In other words, every night when the sun goes down, God calls out his troops. I don't know, I always think of, uh, you know, the toy soldiers in uh, Toy Story. You know, how they all kind of come up marching out and lining up like that. And, and God, he's, he's calling them out. They're lining up. They're obeying him. And, you know, okay, we have to do this. But, you know, astronomers discover a new star to us, and we give it a name. Well, God already has. So, okay, you've got, you've got the universe, you've got, you've got the world, you've got the stuff in the world, you've got these stars, and none of them come close to the God who made them. They, they serve God. Now, have you noticed this? If you haven't, I hope... I hope you notice it right now, and I hope you just try this out sometime. I'm going to read you a portion of Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. And stop right there. Now, who's saying this? Praise Him. Well, for a long time, I read that psalm and said, yeah, God is saying, praise me, praise me, praise me. No. This was sung in temple worship. This is read and sung in Christian churches. And you know what? You know who's, who's saying to the stars, praise God? Who's saying to the sun and the moon, praise God? Us. Because they belong to God. Okay, maybe you feel silly right now. But I invite you... Next time you pray, next time you're alone perhaps, walking somewhere, and just try telling the sun to praise God. Or the moon to praise God. Or the shining stars to praise God. Lightning and hail, praise God. Snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle. Drive by, you know, drive, go down over to Santa Inez, drive by a farm and look at the cattle and say, praise the Lord. This, I'm not being silly. This is what the Psalms will tell us to do. It's all his. And each in its own way, a rock or a star, a, a cow or a tree, lightning or wind, they all are to praise him. Small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. So, how great is God? Well, he's greater than anyone here because we all die. And he lives forever. Uh, put yourself in his hands. And, okay, this, this universe. Uh, yeah. And one of the Psalms, it says, you know, one, one day, you know, the universe will just, you, you'll just shed the universe like old clothing. Because you're clothed in glory. And, and we look to a new heaven and a new earth. But, but the point of all this is nothing around you is permanent. Nothing around you is lasting. Nothing around you is greater than God. Why do you get focused on yourself or on your stuff? Why are you so intimidated? Why do you live as though that were the God and not the living God? Well, what do we do with this? Let me suggest three things we do with it. Like, 
Get humble. Get humble. Uh, you're not supposed to worship the universe, but let the universe that God makes and sustains and, and again, makes it kind of like a craftsman in his, in his workshop makes it. Let the universe point you to the God who's even bigger and let it make you get little. Now, I, I love this illustration. I have to use it at least once a year from G.K. Chesterton. He said there was a little boy who wanted to be big, kind of like in that Tom Hanks movie. Only, uh, you know, as a, as a little seven-year-old, he just wanted to be big, you know, the giant. And so he was granted his wish. And it was exactly what he wanted. He, he, when he got so big, he could, he, could, he could walk across the Atlantic Ocean, you know, in just about you know, five minutes. He could wade in the Pacific Ocean. He could, he could play on the Himalayas. He was just big. And it was so much fun for about a week to be big until it got boring. Because when you're that big, well, the, the Himalayas aren't interesting anymore. And the ocean's not interesting anymore. It's just like a puddle to you. And Chesterton said, now, what if the boy had decided, instead of getting big, to get small? I mean, really small. Tiny. Like, down in the dirt. Which, by the way, is where our word humility comes from. Humus. What would life be like if you were really little? Your backyard would be the Amazon rainforest. Yeah. That little puddle of water over there would be Lake Michigan. Now, the point is, when you get little, everything gets really interesting to you. People do. God does. His world does. Isaiah 57, God says, I live in a high and holy place and with the humble. Two places to find God. Up there where you can't get. Down here where we can all get. So let it make you humble. Um, let it scare you too. Just a bit. In a good way. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Meaning, you if you don't get straight on properly respecting God, you'll not get straight on anything else. Well, who would ever mess with this God? You know, I mean, there ought to always be, just in, in our tenderest moments with God, just this great sense of, whoa. Like with my kids, when they were growing up, uh, during the Star Wars era, and once in a while, we'd, we'd play a Star Wars game called Jabba the Butt. And uh, that was supposed to make them laugh, but... So I'd be Jabba. Daddy was Jabba. I was big and I was scary. And they would start running at me and jumping on me and trying to tear me down. And I'd be growling and yelling and stuff like this. And, and my wife was sitting in the kitchen, standing in the kitchen. She'd be saying, stop it, stop it, stop Because inevitably, at some point, while Daddy was being Jabba the Butt, the kids would start believing I was really Jabba. And they start crying. Then I'd have to reassure them that it's just daddy. You know. But there's, there's a sense, and maybe, uh, maybe this illustration is just screwy, and I should, I should shelve it. But I, you know, there ought to be a sense in which God just scares the daylights out of you once in a while, and then you say, oh, but he's, he's Papa. Yeah. The one who does what he does in the world. I mean, that's my dad. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to mess with him, but uh, he's my dad. Thank you that you're my dad. Let it humble you, this God. Let him humble you. Let it scare you just a bit, healthily. And let it give you comfort. You know, we're back at comfort here. Let the truth of his immensity, which ought to frighten you and which ought to humble you, also give you great confidence and peace that there's nothing too hard for him to do. Nothing. It's big to you. It's easy for him. Nothing can separate you from this God's love. Nothing 
can come between you and this God. No one can snatch you out of his hand. The darkest and most evil encounters you may have in this world are easy for him. Easy for him. Well, be humble, be afraid, and be comforted. Because God is God, and you're not. And therefore, you don't have to be. Let's pray. So, Father in heaven, you are great, and we are small. That's good. Forgive us our pride and our arrogance. Teach us true humility. Lord, give us the grace of holy fear and deep comfort. In Jesus' name, amen. You may go in peace.